Good morning, church. It's really good to be um, up here today and be here with you. And I just want to say that you'll get to know me a little bit more as I go on this morning. So we're going to start with our next reading, which are some excerpts taken from 1 John 4, 7 through 21 in the New Testament of the Holy Bible. Um, I'm using the message translation, which is more about today's language. Can you hear me? Is everybody here? I work in senior living. I can talk loud. <laughs> All right. So 1 John 4, 7 through 21 says this. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love, love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. So you can't know God if you don't love. No one has seen God ever. But if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us and God's love becomes complete in us. Perfect love. There's no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear since fear is crippling a fearful life. Fear of death, fear of judgment, is one not fully formed in love. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating someone, thinking nothing of it, then that person is a liar. And if that person won't love the one that is seen, how can they then love God who is not seen? The command we have from Jesus is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to have love for both. Now, some of you grew up in the Christian church, I imagine, and might remember this song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Wow. Okay. And you know, I learned that song. It's probably one of the first songs I learned. But also know this, I grew up in Sunday school. I memorized the golden rule and how Jesus came to set the sinner free. I know the stories inside out, and I can tell you all about the path that led him up to Calvary. Oh, yes. I grew up in Sunday school. And I know the Apostles' Creed, that 4th century rooted creed that some of you may even remember. It has been my mantra for the last 57 years. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and it goes on. And some of you all are going, huh? That's okay. I like that. And I'm not sure I ever consciously thought differently until I was old enough to understand my faith as more than what I've learned in high church, in Sunday school, or words sung out of a hymn book, or recited creed. Perhaps it's when I started to experience life and understand that what was being taught in a lot of Christian um, realms surely did not quite fit my understanding um, for this loving God that I believe that I am, and so it is, the one that just is, but then I'm getting ahead of myself. Hello, church. My name is Rhonda Hensley, and I am a believer that struggles. I struggle with corporate church systems, um, with church doctrine, with oppressive belief systems, and that good old boy club syndrome of mainstream religion. 
And you know, when Reverend Chris asked if I would talk today, I'm going to admit, I was a little hesitant. Um, you know, I don't know much about you and the UU Church yet, and you don't know much about me and why I've been kind of hanging out here off and on for the last few months. But Pastor Chris said, you know what, just share your story and just see where it leads. So my disclaimer today is that this is not going to be, you know, an academic teaching. And it might be a life lesson, I don't know. But really it's just my testimony and a thank you to you. So yes, once upon a time, here comes my story. I was born in the Methodist Hospital in Dallas, Texas. And I guess you could say I was somewhat predestined to become a Methodist, even though they don't believe in predestination. Um, it's a church in which I grew up. I learned the Bible stories, became confirmed, and was baptized at age 12. It's where I started to sing in the choir, and I led um, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I was also a big part of youth groups. Yes, church fit me, and I loved being part of it. I mean, if I wasn't participating um, in school activities, I was at church. After all, Jesus loved me there. It was a safe space for me. I felt loved and needed and wanted. And it was my refuge when life at home or out there in the world kind of got out of hand. There was no question in my mind, even as a small child, that I was called into ministry, yes, even as a young girl. But then something happened when I turned 28 that changed everything. I fell in love. <laughs> Anyone in here ever fall in love? Come on. Does it change everything? It kind of changes everything. So I fell in love with my lifetime partner, Debbie, who is sitting back here. Um, and she has put up with me for the last 30 years. Yes, 30 years almost. And the secret that I tried to hide from everyone, from myself, and the God of my understanding could no longer be hidden. The door I hid behind may not have been a closet door, but it was a church door. And at 28, I found myself walking out of it, and that door just kind of shut behind me. The year was 1990. Some of you remember those times in 1990. The faith I was so sure of all my life up until then was suddenly on shaky ground. No longer could I sing with confidence that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Because wasn't I also being taught that the Bible said my kind of love was wrong? Life as I had known it <clears throat> up until then was kind of turned upside down. But it was okay because I was in love. And we were having a good time and, you know, you're 28 years old. You have life to live out there. It was great. But about seven years later, I found myself once again at the door of a church. They were opening a new Methodist church out on the island, and I was invited to attend the opening. And when I walked into the door, well, I felt like I had come home. It was familiar. My call to ministry, or perhaps even more, my need for community stronger than my fear to stay away. And so Debbie came with me, Roman Catholic born and raised, into the Methodist Church. And for the next 20 years, Debbie and I um, served a church that could not promise to love us fully or keep us safe from discrimination, yet we stayed. And I say love us fully because as a doctrinal church, it has a rule book, um, the United Methodist Church Book of Discipline, and it stated and still states that our kind of love is incompatible with Christian teaching. And we stayed mainly because, you know, we found a congregation that loved us enough, and we loved them enough. We stayed long enough for me to even, at age 52, to finally answer my call to ministry. I'm slow. And get accepted to seminary at Isla School of Theology in Denver, Colorado one of the 13 United Methodist Church-based seminaries, and we stayed long enough for me to graduate last June with a Master's in Divinity. Now, it may not surprise you that Eiler School of Theology, being in Denver, is progressive, and that many of its <clears throat> professors and pastoral teachers believe the language in the Book of Discipline is wrong, 
and oppressive and not what Jesus taught at all. It is a seminary leading the way towards change in the current United Methodist Church. But it may surprise you, however, to know how many UU students go to ILIF. They actually have their own program uh, for ordination in the UU church. So a Methodist seminary being shaped by a Unitarian Universalist, I'm just saying. It's a good place. But as a member of the United Methodist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas, in the Bible Belt, I have found myself with a seminary degree that I cannot use, at least in ordination. Of course, I could have left the Methodist Church a long time ago and gone to another denomination, um, some that have already worked through their doctrinal language, um, like the Presbyterians and <clears throat> excuse me, the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, and United Church of Christ. They've all gone through this. And um, they've become in inclusive in ordained members of the LGBTQ AI plus, you know, community. But no, I stayed because Methodism was what I knew, and I didn't want to learn another denomination's doctrine, quite frankly. So I chose the path of least resistance. I did, and I admit it. I also stayed because I knew that the fight was about to happen that would hopefully, hopefully bring that long-awaited change to my own beloved church. I wanted to stay so that the reason to change had a human face. Because if we all bail, it doesn't really get changed. But then in February of this year, the United Methodist Church had a special session to our general conference that meets every four years, probably similar to the conferences that the UU Church has. You know, the UMC is a global church and um, is well represented in all areas, local and global. So this special session was called specifically to discuss a way for the church to move for forward in the future as united, as one global church, and to vote on language in the Book of Discipline that had to do with human sexuality, mainly homosexuality. So on February 26th, the delegates to the special session, along with UMC bishops, voted to stay true to a traditional plan. There's the results. They decided to stay true to tradition. You know what that means. Basically, um, they voted to keep the church as it is with tighter restrictions and to uphold the language found in the current book of discipline. <coughs> They were quick to point out that although the church believed that all persons were of sacred worth, there was a but involved. I'm just saying. But if you don't meet the criteria of holy living, then sacred worth went out the window. And here's the rub and where it affects me. And I'm going to read from the Book of Discipline, paragraph 304.3. While persons set apart by the church for ordained ministry are subject to all the frailties of human condition, and pressures of society, they are required to maintain the highest standards of holy living in the world. The practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Therefore, self-avowed practicing homosexuals are not to be certified as candidates, ordained as ministers, or appointed to serve in the United Methodist Church. The next paragraph that I'm going to read comes out, and Blaze will understand this one, the conference, the conference Council on Finance, everybody has to have a finance thing, right? An administration shall have authority and responsibility to perform the following functions. To ensure that no annual conference board, agency, committee, commission, or council shall give United Methodist funds to any gay caucus or group. All people are of sacred worth, but... So on February 26, 2019, for the first time in 57 years, I withdrew my membership to the United Methodist Church. I appreciate that. <laughs> and I no longer could be part of the club, right? I never could be, I, I no longer wanted to be part of it. This illusion that I had lived, and I admit it, again, was that somehow I, we, were an exception to the rule. <laughs> that we had found some ways to fit in, and wasn't that enough? No, 
In reality, we never fit in, and it never really was enough. It isn't even biblical, at least in my understanding. For the first John text that I read earlier to me is very clear. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating someone, thinking nothing of it, that person is a liar. If that person won't love the one seen, how can they love the God that can't be seen? The command we have from Jesus is blunt. That's why I wanted to use this translation, blunt. I like that. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. You know, doctrine makes church exclusive. It puts rules on how to believe and how to live that contradicts at least my understanding and experience of God. But I guess y'all know that, right? There's no doctrine here. So when I withdrew my membership a few uh, months ago, it was like jumping out of a Boeing 767 airplane at high altitude, and I kind of was in this free fall, you know, spinning around. I didn't know if there was a parachute cord for me to pull for a soft landing or if I'd come crashing down and just break into bits. I had no idea. I was sure about my faith and the God I believed in, but I no longer believed in the United Methodist Church. And this is really not a God issue or a faith issue. It might be a theological issue, but really, to me, it's a humanitarian issue. Or as Jesus would describe it, a heart issue, something about love. But lucky for me, I met someone <clears throat> who went straight for my heart and showed me some grace and acceptance. And I met your Reverend Chris Hockman, and we were both at a luncheon, a charter for Compassion Group, go figure. And that's where I met her, and I liked her right away. So she and I met, um, had a meeting, and we talked a little bit about what was happening in the United Methodist Church, and she shared some wisdom of the UU. And lucky for me and for Debbie, I hope, um, she has uh, handed me that right parachute cord. And you, my UU siblings, became the target chosen for a gentle landing. I'm saying it. And that's really why I'm here today, to say thank you. Thank you for being here, even when you didn't know that you were being here for us. I will never forget the first time I walked in those doors and I saw that sign that hangs there. Y'all know which one it is that I saw that um, says you're a welcoming congregation, LGBTQ. I felt like I could breathe for the first time in years. And all of you who hang out there and greet new folks as you come in, um, as we come in, um, well, I felt you're welcome too. And I think it's important for you to know that it matters. It matters. It really, really, really does matter because you matter. You matter because at the end of the day, there are many like us out there in a free fall and breaking away um, from doctrinal Christian churches needing a place to land. And it's not just because of our human sexuality. There's a lot of different reasons. We are human, and we're made for community. The God of our understanding can no longer be contained in a doctrinal rule book. And I know some of you are going, well, duh. Um, well, I'm just a little hard-headed. And um, I just needed a place that I could find where, that allowed God to just be big and expansive. The true I am, and so it is. I needed a church whose wisdom and sources of faith reached further than Christian understanding to the great religions of the world and didn't stop there. I needed a church who recognized that there is still a mystery out there and continues to lure us into this deeper understanding that it has nothing to do with human sexuality or at least is way beyond a faith that is defined by it. You know, Reverend Hockman um, handed me this little book. Where is it? I love this little book. I carry it in my purse, and it's called The Unitarian Universalist Pocket Guide. I love it. <laughs> I do. Um, I read it, and I knew I'd found a, such a place. Because after reading it, I believe I can even hang on to my faith that I have and not be so boxed in so that it may expand bigger than I ever dreamed. Um, all I had to do was turn to the first page. 
that listed out the Unitarian Universalist principles and read the very first principle, and I'm going to read it to you, and you can follow it up on the screen. We, the member congregations of the United, uh, Unitarian Universalist Association covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And here's the amen for me. I don't hear a but. I'm sorry. But that's just the truth, okay? I don't hear a but. It's inclusive. A breath of fresh air that you may take for granted, church. Or not even be aware of it. So I am re-reminding you today. Thank you again. This little book, it tells me that um, there's always been people of faith like you. Um, that make up the UU, and this is what it says on page four. I did not have to get far into this book. Um, and it's a part written by Rosemary Bray McNatt, president of Star King School for the Ministry and contributing editor of the UU World. And this is what she says. Listen, we are the people who sought a religion marked by freedom and reason and acceptance in addition to faith and hope and love. Our forebears were our martyrs who died for religious freedom, ministers who preached that no one is damned to hell or outside the reach of divine love, thinkers who taught us that no spiritual tradition has a monopoly on wisdom. Amen. 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 And I'm just going to, you just went right into what I was going to say. Folks, that call, for me, calls for a Amen. Thank you and amen. That is why I called that my, the title of my message to you today. Thank you and amen to you, the people of the UU church family, and the many who helped form this kind of church. So finally, I'm going to share with you something from a book I read recently written by um, Barbara Brown Taylor, who's an Episcopal priest, who wrote a book called Leaving Church. Because she found that the God that she believed in no longer um, fit neatly into the doctrinal church. And this is what she says. I remembered that what I had known all along, which is that church is not a stopping place, but a starting place for discerning God's presence in this world by offering people a place where they may engage the steady practice of listening to divine words and celebrating divine sacraments, church can help people gain a, a feel for how God shows up, not only in Holy Bibles and Holy Communion, but also in near neighbors, in mysterious strangers, in sliced bread, and grocery store wine. That way, when they leave church, they no more leave God than God leaves them. They simply carry what they have learned into the wide, wide world. I love that. They no more leave God than God leaves them. I may have left the church of my childhood, but my faith in God runs deep. My, you know, my search and seeking for understanding of this God has been really my life's work. And I will always believe that Jesus is the lover of my soul. The Jesus who commanded those who would listen to love God and everyone else. That Jesus. The Jesus who commanded um, or said the one who stood up against oppressors and those status quo people, those powers that be, he stood up against them. That Jesus. You know, to me, his 2,000-year-old wisdom of love being the only way still holds truth. And I'm not sorry I left. And I'm so thankful I found a place, a safe place to land, you, you. Now, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to ask um, that you stand up. And we're going to read, again, the covenant of this church. And as we recite it together, I want you to hear it with new ears. See the words with open eyes. Because someone else is looking for a place to give them a soft landing. Do you believe in this covenant, church? Ready? Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to 
to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve human need, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with all that we hold sacred. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so it is.